Yeah, I, as Peter said, I, I did a PhD in um, prehistoric Irish weapons, and the idea basically was to try and determine how these were used, um, the significance of their use, um, and it was only at the very end of, of, of the three years, actually year four, when I discovered there were major problems with um, everything to do with uh, European Bronze Age weapons and the interpretation of them as actual weapons of war. Um, that's one thing led to another, and I'll basically try and talk you through what I discovered. This, this is a, a very, very broad palette. We, we go all the way from, from Beaker, the very first inhabitants of Ireland, in fact, right through to um, late uh, 18th century. Really, I'm just going to introduce this little story um, using a very simple journalistic technique of uh, five W's and one H, uh, the who, what, where, when, why, and how of the whole story. Um, it's about migration to a large extent, which is very, very topical. And you may have seen a recent programme on Channel 4 um, about the first the first Britain, and I think one of the biggest, the, show, the most shocking thing, the most repeated thing about the whole programme, the whole discovery, was the fact that this guy was black. Um, he had blue eyes, which seemed to swayed a few people, but that was the biggest selling point about the whole thing. Um, Cheddar Man, Cheddar Gorge, he was discovered, and he was probably the first person in after the Ice Age into, into the home of the British Isles. Really, what I want to look at is the development of metal-bladed implements and weapons. Um, I've said metal-bladed implements because it covers a, a wide spectrum of, of, well, tools as well as weapons. Um, you see the first three in this list here are axes, daggers, spears. All of those tend to be implements, they tend to be tools. Uh, the second three halberds, dirks, rapiers and swords are pretty much exclusively weapons. They're, they're, they're instruments of interpersonal violence. You don't go and hunt a boar with a, a sword, generally. Um, I've just, well, and within each of those categories, of course, the subdivisions, because we're covering a span of time here. Um, axes, for example, we start with something as simple as the flat copper kelt. Um, I think they got that name because there's so many of them found in Ireland that were just simply called Celts. Um, it's pure copper poured into an open stone mould, uh, pretty crude, uh, probably not probably not even as good actually as a stone axe, the stone axes that we're replacing. Um, next would have been the, the, a pal staff, that's a, more of a Middle Bronze Age tool, uh, more sophisticated, uh, two-part mould bivalve mould and then finally bronze age um, socketed axe that was a three-part mould very sophisticated uh, and we've moved from copper into copper uh, into bronze by this point and the third one in the series there looks actually to have a lot of tin in it probably decorative given that silver colour halberds are mentioned I think I'll just explain what they are they're very very strange they're in German, it's basically dagger on a stick, um, which describes them pretty perfectly. They're, they are just that. It's hard to tell sometimes if you're looking at, with only the metal parts left, the only the metal component survives, whether you're actually looking at a dagger or a, a, a halberd. It's the hafting um, that gives it away. It's usually a very straight um, line um, left by the wood. Um, and they, fix, they, they, they think they were used in the fashion depicted there. There's no real proof for this, but, and, and it, all the nomads get to there, the butt, the rivet holes, mid-rib, cutting edge, all of that applies equally to, to other blades, as we'll see. This is an actual example of a halberd. This is one in uh, the Ulster Museum across the way. Um, o Lafferty, from his collection, um, 
parish priest of Hollywood County Down, had a very large Bronze Age collection. That is significant that he was the parish priest of Hollywood County Down, um, late 1800s. The period I'm going to be talking about is the Calcolithic and early Middle Bronze Age. The, the material comes from that period. Um, what we're looking at there is a Wessex dagger. And just to give you some idea of scale of a muck, I, I made a few of these just to get some idea of the size of them myself. Um, this one comes from Bush Barrow, uh, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, they're pretty huge for a dagger. Um, now this is two dimensional, obviously, it's, but it gives you some idea. They're not, I mean, I've got fairly big hands and that's not comfortable. It's not something you'd, you'd really imagine using as a tool or wielding in any sort of way as a weapon. And the fact that a surviving portion of the wooden handle there, thousands of little gold nails make this up. I mean, people have written papers on this thinking that it must have been 10 year olds that did this. It's the work's so fine. Um, but it's clearly for display. It's not a practical weapon. Um, but certainly that gives you some idea of the scale of these daggers anyway. The weapon to the right of that uh, is a much later uh, true Middle Bronze Age dagger um, from the Museum of Scotland, uh, National Museum of Scotland in this case. Um, it is Irish. It's one of a pair. Um, there was some debate about whether it was Irish or not. Uh, I think now there's been some uh, metallurgy conducted some some uh, analysis and they're fairly certain it is Irish. Um, the pattern we look at again, I, you'll see in the Wessex dagger there, there's a purely zigzag pattern, <coughs> very simple pattern. That has much the same nomenclature as the, the halberd. It's a middle Bronze Age rapier. I'll be using terms rapier, dirk, sword, it's a bit confusing. It's something that we're stuck with. It goes back to 18th, 19th century. It's simpler to just keep using them and change them. Um, basically, swords, rapiers, dirks. That, it's, a, it's a case of scale. Also function in the case of, of rapiers and dirks. The terms are interchangeable, but the, the function of, of rapier, stroke, dirk, and sword, very different, as I'll, I'll point out. There is Middle Bronze Age sword um, that replaced the rapier. The rapier, it's held that they were a stabbing weapon. Um, that's a lot to do with the, the, the mechanism of attachment. You can see the two rivet holes there right in the peripheral edge of what is a very fine, a very thin butt. They break a lot. Most of the ones that are found are damaged. They're broken. Um, so this, it's, it's been suggested that these are a stabbing weapon. The later Middle Bronze Age sword is developing into a proper leaf-shaped classical sword um, is seen as both a stabbing and thrusting weapon. A true fancy sword. Um, much much more robust, robust hilting mechanism to <coughs> uh, two cheek or, or a slotted piece of piece of wood uh, some organic material, bone or something, would fit around that and be a much stronger, much stronger weapon. We're also looking at how the introduction of metallurgy may have triggered social complexity. How, what what effect that might have had in social complexity? Um, Tilly, um, Charles Tilly, American. Um, American anthropologist uh, come up with a very witty, pithy, war made the state, the state made war. Um, and that's really credited to the, the production of, of metal weapons. As soon as they, they, they produced swords, dirks, rapiers, halberds, that's it. You know, these were used only for fighting. And it, it, the European, particularly the Europeans, particularly the, 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 the Spanish, Barcelona, um, and some French archaeologists would hold that once you start 
producing metal objects, you create a whole hierarchy, it's Marxism at work. And they have a completely, completely Marxist way of looking at these things. Um, and it's not actually that they've gone beyond the fact that it's, it's pugilistic, it's not actually war, it's, it's suppression of the workers through classical Marxism. They, they have to maintain a position, it's a, a, an elite hierarchy, um, and that's really the way they explain the use of weapons. The deposition of these weapons, how we find them, well that varies. Um, this is, this is, uh, uh, we'll also be looking here at uh, trying to point out some of the different ways of depicting the past. This is a, a, an image I took just a photograph of in, in the museum in, in Glasgow. Um, it's explaining three late Bronze Age swords that were found point down, driven into a bog, and just left there and, and subsequently, subsequently discovered. Um, so basically depositions can be dry, usually graves, or wet, bogs, rivers, occasionally lakes, not to my knowledge, intentionally uh, the sea. It's always inland water. Um, you can recover these singly, as single finds, or collectively in groups with, with other, other weapons or any other artefact, um, and that would constitute a hoard, as indeed these three swords, when they were found together, constituted a hoard um, in our guy. It's interesting, I think, the depiction of the guy going through some religious <clears throat> incantation. Um, that's a theme. This is an earlier depiction of a funeral um, on the banks of the River Thames. This is from the Museum of London uh, from the 19, 1974, this one. Um, one of the common themes here is, sorry, I should have pointed out there on the last slide, um, not only the swords, but the shields. There's always an element of, of authenticity in these to an extent. Now, the girl here we can see with the, the big bronze uh, medallion on, on, her, on her belt, that's Scandinavian, that's actually a piece of equipment that exists. Um, the helmets the chaps are wearing there, they're known to exist. The horse sacrifice, because that's what's going on in the corner there, um, that's backed up. There's, there's usually animal, some, part, some parts of animal in, in, in Bronze Age burials. And it's a cremation. So far, so good. The whole incantation thing again, and presumably that sword's going to get thrown into the water because they don't, you don't find late Bronze Age or middle Bronze Age stuff buried with people. Cremation came in burial of weapons and people went out. People were buried pretty much with nothing. Uh, single burials, we'll, come, we'll talk a bit more about that. But all these explanations for how did this, so much of this stuff end up in rivers, particularly the Thames and, and, and other rivers will come to in Ireland. Another explanation again from the 70s was, well, rivers form natural boundaries. There were places of conflict. These people were fighting in the rivers. They were dropping their arms, losing, losing their weapons. That's how so many weapons ended up in these fords, as they often are. Um, that did sometimes happen. This is a much more recent uh, depiction of, um, <clears throat> of a battle in a river. It's a Spanish artist. He does a lot of internet game stuff. It, everybody looks like a hipster. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's interesting to see how, as, as time goes on, it's like, Cowboy films, you can almost tell what decade they were shot in. People reflect themselves. Uh, but this, in fact, isn't too bad. It is of an actual piece of archaeological work. There was a river, there is a river, uh, in the Tullens Valley in Germany, where they found a massive battle, Bronze Age battle, late Bronze Age, a lot of human bones, a lot of horse bones. Wooden clubs, that was it. No bronze swords, no spears, a couple of arrowheads, but that was it. Lots of skulls, blunt force trauma, 
no sharp force trauma anywhere. Um, if and and our friend couldn't resist drawing a sword or two in, in the scene. No evidence at all that they were there. But certainly flint arrows, there were lots of those about. There were a couple of bronze arrows, but lots of blunt force trauma. They were hitting each other over the head with clubs. Now, the other thing we want to look at is the mechanism of diffusion, how this how, how material culture got spread throughout Europe, particularly coming into Ireland. There's two possible ways that happened, either demic, either movements of population, or which are, which are waves of population, or spread of cultural, spread of ideas, which is a much more measured piece. The preferred idea, until possibly quite recently. The area I'm looking at is Atlantic Europe, this map comes from very recent last year. Um, Barry Cunt, Sir Barry Cunliffe. Um, he turned Europe on its side. It actually fits better onto a onto a screen, so that's fine. Um, these three areas: uh, Atlantic, Baltic, and, and Mediterranean. It's to do with the, the rivers. It's to do with the flow off from the hills, um, and that's pretty much the way Atlantic Europe's defined. And it seems to work culturally in prehistory. Transport was obviously much more e easily achieved by waterways and the, the flow of the rivers did determine the spread of, of material and culture. Particularly looking though at the British Isles, Ireland and Britain. The period uh, we're looking at runs right from the Mesolithic, the very first people to arrive in Ireland. Don't know what colour they were. Um, presumably the same as our friend in Cheddar Gorge. Uh, right through to, uh, the late Bronze Age. Calcolithic is a term that's not really used of British Isles. Um, even, the, even, even the pronunciation, <coughs> Chalcolithic, I hear people call it, but I, I call it Calcolithic. Um, it's more prevalent in Europe than Britain. It's a period where it's been described as metal using Neolithic. It's where it's it's Neolithic. The society is Neolithic in culture. That's farming, as opposed to Mesolithic, which is hunter gatherer. Um, but they're starting to use metal weapons. Metal weapons are starting to appear. Metal tools are starting to appear. It's a relatively short period of time here, a couple of hundred years. Um, in Ireland, we recognise the Mesolithic by sites such as Mount Sandal up in Derry. Um, these were seasonal huts. They were circular, basically just saplings bent over, prodded in, leaves round holes, and skins stretched over them. There's, dis there's disagreement about this because you can see in this little, this little reconstruction here, people are carrying in a red deer, red deer, um, hides covering the huts. There's no real evidence for the existence of red hides. Ireland has always been separate from Britain. There has been no land bridge, not in times when people were ever about to use it. There was a land bridge between Europe and Britain, uh, the Doggerland whole thing. People, well, lots of things could have moved backwards and forwards there. Ireland, no, it's the, the, the closest part between Scotland and Ireland. It's, it's very close, but it's, it, it's very deep, possibly because it's very close. So there was never a land bridge there. It's, it's a relatively short hop on a good day. Um, if they did have skin boats, they could have, well, they must have done it. They simply must have done it. Uh, one of the things with, with um, Neolithic is, is the graves, the, the, the actual culture they use, the communal graves, large graves like Balanahati, Giant's Ring. Um, they're living in square houses, not round ones. And they were doing large communal graves. The, the reconstruction there shows a, a court cairn. Uh, these would have had several 
again, ashes quite often was the way they were cremating, but also uh, token parts of people, not whole bodies. What they did with bodies is, is we don't know, but it was strange and there was stuff going on. It's rare to find a complete skeleton from this period. Lots of bits of ash, lots of bits of bone, very few articulate remains. That changed. That changed. This is from Rathlin, poking out of a, of a, of a weathered away bank, it is what we call a kist burial. It's basically a, a, a rectangular hole lined with stone, lined with slabs of stone, and an individual buried in it. So that, this is the dawn of indiv individual burials, and this is the Bronze Age proper. The advent of kists covered with round cairns of stones um, has been linked to it's been linked to a change in population, which we'll see we'll see more about in a minute. And um, the question of why we do this, well, that's quote from um, yeah, 19, uh, nineteen eighty four. Um, who controls the past controls the future. So it's not, yeah, that's okay. The other reason is why is because the past is used, um, as I said, there's, there's, it's very political in, in some parts of Europe, um, and it has been used, certainly, um, as an excuse for everything ranging from totalitarianism at home uh, to, to colonialism abroad. Um, Usually it's a racial thing, um, and people are very keen to use a glorious past to, um, to excuse all sorts of behaviour. How, how do we actually make sense of the past and prehistory? Well, it's prehistory, that's the first problem, there are no records. We have to use proxies. The main things we look at are material culture. That's basically just a term for stuff. Everything that we find, all artefacts, all material, is material culture. Um, artefacts are things that are made by people. People invest themselves into it. We have to try and interpret it. Origin legends have kept in there because we'll come to that. They're in, in nowhere more so than Ireland are they important. Um, then the two more scientific techniques, DNA and isotope analysis and radiocarbon dating. People have come up with a very imaginative way of using these. Um, material culture, the oldest is possibly ceramics. There's two different pots. Um, we look at catalogues. We build up catalogues by association and we end up being able to say, this is early, this is late. And the general tip trend is from simple to complex, that is with all, all material culture, that tends to be the way it works. And we can then take a pot, look in the catalogue and say, this is an early beaker pot. And the one below it is probably midway down that series. And this allows us to do it. It's not just ceramics we do that with, we can do it with metalwork as well. There are huge catalogues of, of Bronze Age, everything. Axe heads, daggers, swords, everything. Uh, mostly German catalogues, um, they're extremely useful. If you find something new, you just look it up and make, find something, yes, it looks like that. Um, type and period, there's a slight problem. I've shown one there, that's the one that I mentioned earlier from the dagger um, from Scotland. Now, it's down there's a type Hammersmith and a type Antrim dagger and a Group 1 Dirk. It's all of those things. It appears in three different catalogues. The same item appears in three different catalogues. Um, it's an Irish Antrim type Antrim. It's an English type Hammersmith, a British type Hammersmith. And it's also been catalogued as a Dirk. Slight confusion with this transition stuff. The axe is type Bally Valley. They're all given names after the place, the areas, the, 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 the representative uh, samples found. 
So the, 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 the type uh, axis is actually from wherever the name is from. Uh, the period is also given a, a, a place, a name, usually from a hoard. Both of these are Irish. One's in Scotland, the dagger, that's a Scottish uh, National Museum of Scotland accession number, DJ20. The axe, the little axe, is from, uh, is, is in the British Museum. They're, they, well, you can't, you can see it on the, on the axe, it's got a similar pattern to the, the beaker vessel, the ceramic vessel, but actually the, it's not very clear, but from the drawing out of the catalogue you can see that there's a similar pattern on the dagger. This is a very Irish thing, very Irish. The beaker pot is from Scotland, but the two, uh, the two metal artefacts are Irish. Um, okay, so just talking about beaker people. They're best known from southern England, from round Wessex. This is the Innsbury Archer. Uh, he's probably the most famous individual from the Beaker period. He was discovered uh, down in Wessex, close to Stonehenge, just above the Isle of Wight. Typically, there's, there's what they call a Beaker package. They're buried, I, I said earlier, people aren't buried, that, that's the Bronze Age. Beaker people, they certainly are. They're buried with the pot we looked at, the Beaker pot, the distinctive Beaker pot. Uh, the little gold, they were called earrings, but now they think they're hair tresses. They're not quite sure what they are. Um, lots of arrowheads. Um, there's actually wrist guards as well, which I haven't included, but they're little guards that stop the, the, the string whipping your uh, wrist. And three tanged copper daggers. That's the important thing with this guy. Metal. It's the first time they've appeared. And this is English Heritage's, uh, an English Heritage representation of him. It's a nice drawing. Um, you might notice he's got a strange posture. His left leg is quite fine compared to his right. And if you actually look back into the, his grave, you'll see that his, his, uh, his left leg is much smaller. The bones are much smaller. He would serious damage to his leg. He would have had a limp. He would have a uh, subcurating wound. He would have been in a lot of pain. He also had... Um, serious problems with his teeth, this guy wouldn't have been happy. But the most amazing thing about it is this cushion stone. This is a metalworker's tool. It's for fine metalwork. It's a stone anvil. So this guy was not only a consumer of metal, he was actually a creator of metal goods. And He wasn't local, we'll come to that. But Stonehenge was just three miles away from where he was buried. Um, Stonehenge and Wessex culture, very important. Um, this is another illustration of a druid because Stonehenge is forever associated with druids. This happened here it happened, uh, 1815. This was a book, we'll, we'll come to it later, um, that supposedly depicted the garbs of the, the, the costumes of the original Britons. And everything he has, his gorget, which is pictured there, it's gold, a big gold gorget. And on, on his head, it's, it's assumed to be a necklace, but they put it in his head here. Um, uh, gold lunula, all Irish. Um, these are all Irish. I, the, all, uh, well, the snake obviously drinking the milk isn't Irish. Um, but the lunula and, and the rest of the gold artifacts are. And if you notice on the lunula there, I've, exp I've, I've just expanded that image to an extent, and you can see again that diamond, that triangular artwork. Very Irish. It's bigger, but it's very Irish. So, 
origin legends. Well, the Book of Invasions talks about waves of invaders. Just one after the other. Um, these are very popular with, uh, still today, well, particularly very new agey. Um, and depictions of those, again, fall back on Bronze Age artefacts. Guy here holding a bronze socketed axe. You can see how the, the work there, this one's from um, Must Farm, recently discovered site in England, um, where a habitat of about, I think it was about five roundhouses on stilts on a lake caught fire and everything was pretty much just dropped into the lake, was covered in silt and survived. Um, lovely socketed axe there with the, with the handle still on it. And um, oh, this is from Central Europe, uh, the Nebra Sky Disc. It was found quite recently um, by metal detectorists and quite knocked about. They took it out of the ground without any ceremony, damaged it. But this depicts sun, moon, and the, com the, the little cluster there in the, the center right of um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven Pleiades, which is quite amazing if you think they're representing things like the Pleiades and the Bronze Age. The origin legends, okay, the tooth, the Danian, these were metal workers, supposedly. This is where, these are the people who supposedly brought metal to Ireland. Um, just a chance to put some lovely slides up, actually, by uh, John Duggan. Now, this is a Scottish artist, um, symbolic artist, who's working with, very much working with Irish mythology. Um, and the stuff they're carrying here is the tree of life and knowledge, the sword of the the will on the active side, whatever all this is about. But the, the one the one thing that interests me here is actually. Oh, I'll come back to that. The one thing that's actually of interest to me here is the so the the shield, which is a real shield from the British Museum. It's an Iron Age shield. But it's Celtic in design, and it's, if you notice, the circular flowing Celtic design, very different to the angular previous speaker design. Well, all of these people that we've looked at there, all of them at some point have been credited to Spain. The origin of all of these people was Spain. And if you look at some of the old maps, you can possibly see why this is one. Uh, Gerald Wales in, in uh, this is one he used and you can see that Spain is just well a hop skip from Ireland they thought it was right you know so so obviously people could come to Ireland from Spain very easily whereas Britain they came from France from 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 Germany and there's this long enduring idea that the Irish somehow connected with Spain and that's been very persistent. Back to the characters um, drawn by American Smith. You can see here the, a stylized uh, original British native um, from 1815. There's nicely almost the board and she had beard. Um, all the equipment he has there, that's that stuff, basically antiquarians, they, they only really knew ancient Britain from what they read in, in classical literature. Pliny described the British as having brindle cows, very good for cows, and described as having good dogs, good fighting dogs, um, and described various other aspects, all of which have been represented here. The round <coughs> shield, um, they would have known about that was found in Scotland in 1791. The axe head, they knew it, that's from Northern Britain as well. The spear is actually not a spear, it's a middle Bronze Age rapier that they haven't quite understood how it worked and they've thought this is a long headed spear. It must have fastened onto 
a shaft like this. And that's prescient, that, but we'll come back to that as well. Um, British weren't obviously the only ones at this. This is uh, the French doing much the same thing. It was part of nation building. It was part of getting this idea of we, we come from a, a noble line of warriors. And all the kit he's wearing is Bronze Age. Everything. In the museum, he's actually sitting facing a Roman cavalryman, full size. And they imagine these were all contemporary. They weren't. I mean, they were thousands of years out with all this stuff. Uh, I mentioned that the other scientific proxies now we're looking at are oxygen isotope levels. We use the, the teeth enamel from the Amesbury Archer and what we were able to work out very well, what was worked out very quickly was he's not from about here. They could see that he wasn't British and in fact he's from the Alps, Central Europe. So he travelled from Central Europe over to Britain in his own lifetime. Uh, he'd grown up, basically, in Central Europe. So that supports the idea of metalwork coming in from Europe that has long been suspected. There was another grave found nearby, which actually had some, some skeletal characteristics, had actually a, 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 an inherited uh, foot not a problem, just, just a, little, a little horn on the, on the heel that's genet genetically inherited. And they think it was probably um, his son, possibly his nephew. So there were families on the move. Looking at material moving, if we look at stone, this, this is going back to the Mesolithic, Neolithic. <clears throat> the movement in, the, in, in, in that, those times is in, incredible, absolutely amazing. Geodite axes, we know where they come from. They come from right down there uh, in the Alps, almost into Italy. And they travelled all the way out, right across into Portugal, up into Scotland. The trade route, well, trade routes or people moving. It's hard to work out which. This, the thing, it, it was long distance trade and, and down the line trading for a long time, but recently I think people are starting to believe that it's people are carrying these things. These are personal possessions. This is, represents people moving. Perselenite is a very peculiar stone. It, it's particular to Northern Ireland. This stone is only found um, in two places, um, Tivula, in North Antrim and Rathlin. The only two places you can find it. However, it's spread all over the British Isles. I think there's some even got into France, but not sure. It's all over. It's moved out of Ireland in a big way. You can see the, the diffusion there. So it's probably a spread of population. And with that, cultural ideas. That's a picture of the Malone Howard. It's in the museum across the street. Um, it was discovered just up the road. A lot of these, there's, I think, 20,000 of them or something they know of. Huge numbers. Interestingly, greenstone axes uh, from Cumbria. What struck me is how few made it across the other direction. There's no great flow of, of British material here in this instance, certainly coming across into Ireland. That, I think, is interesting. An innovative use of radiocarbon dating. Um, recent paper where uh, they looked at the concentration of radiocarbon dates. Not so much dating material, but looking, once you have the dates, then looking and saying, where's this focused? And treating it as activity. Two spots you'll notice here, obviously down south, down the Wessex culture, around Stonehenge, but also. If you look up in Scotland, it's lighting up there as well. Ireland wasn't part of this survey, but there's a, there's a dark corridor between the two bright areas. So I think it's reasonable, nobody's looked into this, but I think it's reasonable to suggest that it's not unsimilar to what happened millennia later. There's a movement of people and ideas 
from Ireland into, uh, into Scotland, Northern England. We know that it doesn't require a lot of people. I mean, a dozen people in the case of St. Aidan were enough to take an awful lot of cultural changes into the north of Britain. Um, and they didn't get very far. I mean, it was what haircuts and holidays didn't work. Eventually, Roman uh, Christianity won the day. But it's, I think, an interesting parallel. That southern hotspot does match with Stonehenge in the Wessex culture. And here we see, again, a picture from 1815, American Smith, a wonderful book, this great religious festival held by Druids. That area is very rich in ritual monuments. Number the dying, there are dozens of barrows. You can see they're sort of lined up. There's a lot of alignment going on. The Bush Barrow is one of the richest, and that's where this came from, from a character dubbed the, the King of Stonehenge. Um, he wouldn't have known Stonehenge looking like that. He'd have known a much simpler Stonehenge. Stonehenge was used for hundreds of years by different cultures. What we're looking at there, what basically is, is ritual, yes, but ritual is practice. Religion, religion involves a secondary component, practice and belief. Archaeologists are very wary about getting involved in religion because of that component of belief. We have no idea what they believed. We can never know what they believed. We just can't. We have to try and discern what they did and what they might have thought, but it gets very, very, very tricky. This is one of the stones, one of the inner stones in Stonehenge. Secondary use is what I'm looking at here. You can see graffiti on it up at the top there. People have put their names in it, graffitied the thing over, over many years. But right in the centre there, a dagger and an axe, they're old. They're not the same age. The axe is considerably older than the dagger, but they're much more recent than the original Stonehenge. This is a, this is a way secondary set of people that have come along and reused Stonehenge. These people were held to be physically different. And this little Maxim grew up. Long barrow, long skull, round barrow, round skull. For a long time that was thought to be just a, gener a generalisation too far. Recently it's got a little bit of traction because some of the DA evidence more or less supports this idea. <coughs> um, the Victorians were very keen on this whole racial thing and come up with lovely ideas like this. I know the guy on the right, okay, the one on the left, I don't know who he is, um, but it'd be interesting to try and find out because he's the one who got replaced by the lovely Teutonic chap there. The DNA evidence, uh, that's been worked on by Queen's. Eileen Murphy's been very involved in that. Uh, recent paper has suggested that there were wave, big waves of people coming in, replacement sized populations. Um, three individuals were looked at, uh, one Neolithic and two Bronze Age. The Neolithic individual Her genes actually suggested black hair, brown eyes, and that's a reconstruction. The value of these reconstructions, I'm, I'm not convinced of. Anyway, they think she looked a bit like that if she was made of clay. <clears throat> Working with useware analysis, this is what I, I looked at in particular. This is what my PhD was about. Um, basically came up with four different types of damage, a V-notch, U-notch, dent and bow, that was enough. Um, and really just a grid 
for the actual blades, the swords and the dirks and the daggers, the, not daggers, the swords, dirks, rapiers. And I would basically just align with that grid and just look around and where there was damage, just mark it and write a little bit about the nature of it. There was a problem straight away. The British and Irish material were colossally different, hugely different. The rapiers, which were supposed to be thrusting, the Irish ones, they had much more damage along the edges, which suggested they were being parried with. They were being used as fencing weapons rather than thrusting weapons. It didn't make sense. And it was particular to Irish material. It just didn't make sense at all. Then you start actually examining the Irish stuff. This is an Irish dagger. Stroke, dirk. This one falls in two categories. It's got a W number on it. It's from the museum down in Dublin. W for Wilde, William Wilde. Catalogued all these. The things to note about it are the tip, which has been resharpened on an anvil, just with a whack. Just bang, sharp. And the fact that it's been joined together, because these were freak, almost always broken at the point of deposition, or bent and broken when you try to straighten them. And these hammering marks up around the butt. Didn't make sense. It's modern, but it doesn't make sense. Then found this in the Ulster Museum. Didn't know what to make of it. I thought somebody's made some sort of garden implement out of this. It's like a, some sort of hoe or something. And really wasn't interested in it at all, but took a couple of pictures of it. And did notice that it was Downshire, Downshire collection, uh, the date. Pretty much in the down chairs and out of business. But then oh, recently found the records on it, which are not down with the also they're up in Coltra, whereas the material the, the artifact itself is down Heron Road, so I didn't see them both together. It actually says probably reused in nineteen seventeen ninety eight. And it was in the collection of Arthur Hill. Second Marks of Downshire, Colonel of the Royal Downshire Militia, and it's part of a trophy hoard, a trophy collection. This has been collected up after the battle, and he's known what it was. It's been a pike, and he's thought, yeah, I'll have that, and keep it in my collection. And that's a steel for a little socket on it, and you can see even the little hole where they put the nail in through the shaft. And that one's been sharpened with a bang on an anvil at the tip. And suddenly you start seeing everywhere. This is one from Scotland. Again, uh, museum mm -hmm. in Scotland, National Museum, Edinburgh. A lot of Irish stuff in Scotland. The, this has been reworked. It's been drilled by modern drill, steel drill bits done that. You can tell by the, just the entry of the exit. It's not Bronze Age, that's modern. To take probably an iron socket which has been taken off whenever they've taken it back into the museum because that frequently happens. No record kept of it. Um, and then you see this other strange thing where stuff's being soldered together with lead solder and then used. Because if you see the patina damage on an inch, it takes three and a half thousand years for that patina to build up, a nanosecond for it to come off and it doesn't build up again. That can only be modern damage. What's surprising is it didn't fall apart because lead solder just doesn't work very well with bronze. You see things like this. Now it's been suggested the, this, this rejoining might have been done by collectors to improve the value of it. Well, I can't see how that improves the value of that. This is just a bit of tin plate wrapped around and soldered on. It's very typical of an Irish tinker just doing a job very crude, just to get the thing working again, just to get the thing usable again.
Um, that's the original size that there's a bit missing. They just shunted the two parts together, didn't try and match them. That's a very complex break, so they just thought, oh, wrap a bit of tin around it, a tin plate. Where is this sort of thing happening? Every blacksmith in Ireland, according to the records anyway. <clears throat> uh, certainly, this drawing by Cruikshanks shows, this is, this is in Dublin, this is for the, the 1803 rebellion, but nonetheless. And a more contemporary caricature, Gilroy, shows um, United Irishmen in training. Not the training that's interesting to me, but the bottom right hand corner. The big grindstone and then refurbishing the ancient weapons. I would suggest plundered from big houses and put back into use. I think this stuff came from cabinets of curiosity, something sharp, get that at the end of the stick, it'll do rightly. It's a pike. <coughs> this one we actually have records for. The Bill of Seal states that it was a bronze sword with a hide grip taken at New Ross, 1798. This one's now in Canada. It's part of a job lot that ended up in Canada. They have a very good Bronze Age collection in Ontario. When the leather handle was taken off, uh, which is the lower view, just by sheer coincidence, it had already been repaired. That hilt is a replacement hilt, but it's a Bronze Age replacement. They fixed, they, they fixed damages to hilts in the Bronze Age. They never fixed damages to blades for some reason. Anywhere you see a, a, a repaired blade, it's modern. This is modern. This is a rapier. <clears throat> but patina damage along the edge there, that tells you that it's modern. The patina's been knocked about, broken off, it's modern damage. The crossblade damage isn't. That's ritual. That's ancient damage. We go back to that halberd we looked at. There's the same damage on the butt. It's where the organic hilt has been hacked off, probably with an axe. And an axe has been used around the edge. That's not damage of wet blade on blade contact in some sort of combat scenario. That's a very broad, dull blade that's hit it and the patina has grown, developed over the top of it. That is ancient peridepositional damage. That particular one there, you can see a double strike. That's been hailed and hit and it's done that. And you can see there's actually a double strike on it and that's all the way around. That's been some sort of ritual damage. Once you start seeing ritual damage, you start seeing it everywhere. This crossblade damage or some, and this hacking around the organic hilt to remove it. Again and again and again you see that with Irish material. There's damage around the rivet, damage around the butt, but no damage to the blade. The blade's quite often pristine, unless they're doing damage directly to the blade prior to bending it. This one's interesting. One of the suggestions is that these are weapons that belong to warriors, as we saw earlier on, where the warrior was being burnt and his sword was being thrown in the river. This suggests otherwise. This is a late Bronze Age sword. A little sequence with this one. The first thing that's happened is the handle's been damaged. This is a cast-on uh, terminal. The handle's got broken. Taken it to the, the smith, who's cast on a new, a new part so they could put an organic hilt on it again. Those two red marks show where he's left a depression in the mould so he could drill through it, but it hasn't been drilled. It hasn't been, had a new hilt fit, fixed to it. It's blown. It's gone wrong in the mould when they've been trying to repair it. And the, the blacksmith's just gone, ugh, what do I do? He says, oh, somebody said, well, look. Give to the priest. Then we see axe marks here at A and B. Again, the usual routine. Been hit with an axe. 
It's been bent and broken at its finest point and put in the river. It's that triple death thing that that you see it's it's beaten, bent, possibly broken, and put in the river and put in the and drowned. Um, Ned Kelly's described this for bone bodies, this idea of triple death, and that's what seems to be applied to, to Bronze Age artifacts as well. Moving towards the end here. This is what happens to Bronze Age weapons across the early Bronze Age and the Middle Bronze Age. Green is, is dry, blue is wet. England and Wales, early Bronze Age, everything's buried. Scotland, not so much. Ireland, 50-50. Different. At the same time, different things are happening. By the Middle Bronze Age, it's nearly all put in wet deposition. By the late Bronze Age, it's 100%. Th that 5% represents a very small number of graves. It's, it's, it goes from dry, buried with people, to put in the water. And the fact that it's England, Scotland, Ireland, in that order, suggests a movement of ideas. This, if we look only at one particular type of dagger, the one with the fancy little decoration on it, the triangles, the V triangles, just looking at that one type, because we know they're Irish, pretty sure they're Irish, even though these ones from 28 on down are catalogued as English. When you actually look at them, it changes. Sorry, just go back there. It changes to all the way down to here, where I've, it, it hasn't actually come out terribly cleverly there. Red, English, or continental, triangular Irish. Basically all that material right down, right down into the south of England is Irish. It's been a huge influx of Irish weapons, uh, uh, Irish people, or material, or both. We don't know which, much more so than has been previously thought. Um, and the Irish way of doing things caught on and stuck. And why shouldn't the metal be Irish? Well, this, this is actually a distribution of Irish metal. Um, gold and axes, Irish lunulas, which we looked at earlier, and axe heads, which we looked at earlier. And Ireland was exporting like mad. It, it was exporting all across Europe. Um, certainly these artefacts. So there's no reason why the, the, the daggers and the, the swords and everything else should have followed the same routes. The evidence for this change in culture can be seen. I visited the Museum of London and just for a different reason took a photograph of this particular dagger. It's the first one, as it happens, it's the first dagger that was earliest dagger, sorry, earliest style of dagger that was taken out of the Thames. Um, you can tell by the hilt mark on it that it still had its hilt on when it was put in the, in the water. And that hilt remained there for a long time, um, allowing a, 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 a differential uh, uh, corrosion. The, around, the area around the hilt underneath the wooden uh, handle was protected and is thicker. And you can actually see the mark just in between those two dotted lines. So that wasn't, that wasn't, didn't have the handle hacked off it, as was the Irish way. This one did. This is a later one. And the handle's been hacked off it. And we can see what look like axe marks around the butt and around the rivet. And this is several hundred years later than the first one. I haven't looked at any more than that. That's that's ongoing research. These are just um, from the catalogues, more what I believe to be Irish dirks, uh, Irish daggers. Um, they've been drawn in a way that suggests that there's damage there. They've been, they've been hacked at. 
but I can't tell without physically looking at them. But certainly, it, to me, warrants further investigation. Um, and basically what this does is change the direction of flow of ideas and material fr from Europe through England, Scotland to Ireland and flips it round. actually probably I suspect from northern Spain maybe through Brittany, maybe through touching through at Cornwall but certainly coming fairly directly to southern Ireland working up through Ireland and then flowing down through Scotland into the north of England and I think as far down as the Thames. So I think there's been a massive underestimation of how influential Irish culture and Irish material was uh, in the late, Bleak, late Neolithic, early Bronze Age and the bringing of metal to Britain was probably very largely an Irish thing, which I say in the summary, in the conclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.